there's a picture in my head that I get. Like, it just pops in my head. When you say the word dinosaur, something in my head just, just goes in there. Like, it's a specific picture. That's the way that all words work. You know, you say a word, you know, you say something, and there's a corresponding concept that, that's attached to that word. So when you say the word dinosaur, something pops in my head, and I think of something that's going to be big and green and reptilian and, you know, scaly. Maybe it's got some spikes on it. I'm thinking this giant, majestic being. That's the picture that goes into my head no matter what when you say the word dinosaur. But recently, I learned something that kind of bummed me out and kind of fights against the whole majestic thing. And that something is this. Some dinosaurs had feathers. Sure enough, feathers. And this is a problem for me because there's never been a creature ever in the world that is majestic that has feathers. It's never happened. Like nobody looks and says, oh, the mighty kiwi, so majestic. Or the mighty ostrich. Or the mighty eagle, the eagle's not majestic. It's, it, there's nothing majestic about an eagle. It's small and tiny. I'm not going to argue about this. Birds are not <laughs> majestic. <laughs> if you've got a feather, you're not majestic. That's what I'm trying to say, at least in, in my mind. And so, okay, so dinosaurs have feathers. That's kind of a bummer. And so I got to thinking, I was thinking about this, and I thought, okay, how can I continue to believe that dinosaurs are majestic um, and still believe that they have feathers? So I replaced in my head this picture. And this picture in my mind now is suddenly that these, 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 these you know, dinosaurs, these giant feathers that were these crazy colors. Like I thought, oh man, like they're purples or they're blue or red or just like black. I mean, just these amazingly awesomely colored. And I was like, okay, great. Okay, so I can picture in my head, okay, maybe it's not as majestic as it once was. But sure enough, they're going to have these amazing, amazing, just awesome colors. And then I tried to learn some more about dinosaurs, and my bubble was burst again, because sure enough, the leading paleontologists in the world have come to the conclusion that, having studied this, come to the conclusion that the color of the feathers on the dinosaurs was brown, like dirt colored. And we're suddenly not majestic anymore. And I guess it makes sense. Like, you're trying to, like, blend in with your environment. Like, if you're purple, it's going to stand out and, you know, predators and stuff. I totally get it. But man, just dirt brown feathers are just not majestic at all. And so as it turns out, this picture in my head that has always popped into my head has been wrong whenever I hear the word dinosaur. In the same way, we have a picture in our minds. When I say the word hell, all of you have a distinct picture that goes into your head. All of us. It's almost uh, uncontrollable. Like, we, it pops in our head. We think of, you know, underground, the you know, caves and, you know, cliffs and volcanoes. We think of, you know, fire and, and lava. And we think of, you know, you might probably, maybe you think of, you know, a guy in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork. You know, we, we have a specific picture of what hell looks like. And it almost seems like we got it out of a movie because we've seen it in movies so often. And the truth is, part of the reason why it seems like we got it out of a movie is because we basically did. At least we got it out of, you know, 700 years ago's version of a movie. You see, there was this guy named Dante, and he was a poet. And he wrote a giant epic poem called Divine Comedy. And the first part of that was called Inferno. And you may have heard of Dante's Inferno before. And in that, he describes what hell looks like. And for whatever reason, for the last 700 years, the picture that Dante described in what was a fictional poem that was entertainment, essentially a movie for them, that's our picture of hell that's in our head, which is the easiest way to put it is that's really dumb for us to do that. It's kind of like, you know, if you were to say, okay, what does Nordic religion look like? And you go and you watch the new Thor movie, you say, oh, I know, it's Thor. I mean, that's a really bad way of learning information is, you know, watching movies or looking at fictional entertainment and saying, okay, well, that's the way I do it. And so the question is this. We, we started this conversation last week about hell, okay? And we talked about how hell is this mysterious thing that, you know, throughout church history, if you go, you know, you predate you know, the Catholic Church kind of consolidating beliefs. You know, you go before that, you know, there was a lot of different beliefs. There were three different beliefs about what hell looked like, you know, the, of what hell's function was, of what hell's purpose was, of who went there and all of that. You know, what happened, you know, we, we talked about how, you know, some people, it's this eternal place, which is torture. Some people looked at it as, you know, it's a destruction. Some people looked at it as, you know, a temporary place where sin 
sins are purged. We talked about all of that, but then we also talked about how Jesus taught that there was kind of good news about hell. But as we talk about hell, as we began this conversation last week, a question. What picture in our mind should we have about hell? When I say the word hell, what should be popping up in your head? It's not Dante. That's like Thor. But what should it be? And I submit that the answer should be something that's 1,300 years before Dante, and that's whatever it was Jesus thought. I think it's a pretty good standard. You know, whatever we think about something, if, if we're agreeing with Jesus, that's good. So, for example, when we read in Mark chapter 9, Jesus say this. He says to his disciples one day, he said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better to enter eternal life with only one hand than to go into the unquenchable fires of hell with two hands. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off, because it's better to enter eternal life with only one foot to be thrown into hell with two feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It's better to enter the kingdom of God with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the maggots never die and the fire goes out. Jesus talked about hell. We saw it three different times. What was Jesus thinking when he said hell? What were his, what it was his audience? What was the picture that popped into their head when they heard the word hell? Or a little later in his ministry, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. And he told them this. He said, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites. For you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell you yourselves are. A little later, he says, you snakes, you sons of vipers, how will you escape the judgment of hell? How, what was it the Pharisees heard when Jesus said, you are sons of hell or the judgment of hell? Again, this is 1,300-ish years before Dante. They weren't thinking caves and lava and volcanoes and fire and dude with a pitchfork. It's not what they were thinking. So the question is pretty much this. Number one, what were they thinking when Jesus said hell? What was Jesus thinking when he said hell? And number two, I said last week that whenever Jesus talks about hell, he's giving us some good news. Last week, that good news was pretty obvious, that God is the one with the power of hell, and so we shouldn't be afraid because the ones who want to hurt us don't have power. That's good news. The question is, what is the good news in Jesus' picture of hell? And to answer that, we need to have a conversation. We need to back up about 700 years before Jesus is born, and we need to have a conversation about this place that was a valley that surrounded the city of Jerusalem that was called Ben Hinnom. We need to have a conversation about Ben Hinnom. So about 700 years before Jesus was born, there was a king, a Hebrew king, who reigned over Jerusalem, and his name was Ahaz. And Ahaz was a terrible king. He didn't care about the people. All he cared about was himself. He didn't care about God. All he cared about was himself. And so no sooner did he take over in office than he decided he wanted to kind of put the people in their place. And so the people, they loved to worship God. They were committed to their faith. They were committed to their religion. And so he said, you know what? One easy way for me to get them away from this is to take their religion from them. So he went all over Jerusalem, all over uh, Judah at the time, and he built these different altars. He built different uh, monuments to these foreign gods, and he started instituting this worship of other religions in Israel. Now, that wasn't enough. The people of Israel didn't go for it. And so he decided, okay, well, what I need to do is I need to give them no other options. And so he went to the temple, and he closed it down. He, drew all the, he drove all the priests away, he, he, shut, he locked the doors, he shut it down, and there was nothing that the people could do because he had completely taken their religion from them. Now that is bad enough. But Ahaz is probably the most wicked king in the history of the Hebrew people. And the reason is not just because he had a different religion, it's not just because he shut down the temple, but it's because of what we read in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 28. We read this. Ahaz offered sacrifices in the valley of Ben Hinnom, even sacrificing his own sons in the fire. 
Now, the writer of Chronicles here does not give this the weight I think maybe he should. He just signed a, you know, sort of matter-of-factly says this horrible thing. So let's make sure we understand this horrible thing. See, there was this god, and his name was, was Moloch. Moloch was this, this pagan deity that was a deity of war and violence and everything else. And if you wanted his protection in war, you would need to make a sacrifice. And Moloch demanded one kind of sacrifice and one kind of sacrifice only, a child. To worship Moloch, you had to set your children on fire and burn them alive until they were dead. That's horrible. But Ahaz did it. He was so committed to this, in fact, he even murdered his own son in the process. Now, Ahaz wasn't in power very long. About 15 years or so, he was in power. And his, his, one of his sons that he didn't burn to death was named Hezekiah. And Hezekiah ends up taking over um, as king. And Hezekiah's first order of business is to get rid of everything his father did. Hezekiah believed in God. And he believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He wanted the people of, of, of Israel to once again return, repent, and come back to God. And so Hezekiah, the first thing he does, he goes and he reopens the temple. He tries to tear down every altar, every idol that he can to all these other gods. And during Hezekiah's reign, he tried very, very hard to restore the people back to God. Unfortunately, while Hezekiah did a whole lot, there was at least one place Hezekiah didn't touch. And that was the valley of ben Hinnom. So when Hezekiah's son, who's named Manasseh, takes over, Manasseh has a choice to make. Do I follow in the footsteps of my father and worship the God of the Israelites? Or do I follow in the footsteps of my grandfather? And Manasseh decides he's going to be Kylo Ren. He follows in the footsteps of the dark side of his grandfather instead of the goodness of his father. And so Manasseh, Seeing this altar to Moloch does the exact thing his grandfather did. As we read again in 2 Chronicles, this time in chapter 33, we read that Manasseh also sacrificed his own sons in the fire in the valley of ben Hinnom. So we have two kings, one of which reigns for 15 years, one of them reigns for about 55 years, so about 70 years total. And they instituted this worship to Moloch, this deity who demands child sacrifice by burning them alive. In my opinion, and I think probably the opinion of most people, or it should be the opinion of most people, basically the worst possible thing you could do would be to burn a child alive until they are dead. And yet this was common practice, not just by the king of Judah, but by the people who followed him. Now, the next time we hear of Ben Hinnom, it's another king coming down the road. His name is Josiah. And Josiah decides enough is enough. I've learned from the mistakes of Hezekiah. I've learned them from the mistakes of, of, of Ahaz and Manasseh. And as we read in 2 Kings chapter 23, we read one more time, then the king being Josiah defiled the altar of Topheth in the valley of Ben Hinnom so that no one could ever use it again to sacrifice a son or daughter in the fire as an offering to Moloch. Okay. So our timeline here, we have a king named Ahaz who institutes this practice of sacrificing children. We have another king who comes along and doesn't get rid of it. So then another king comes along and he does the same thing this time for about four times as long as Ahaz does. And it's not then to another couple kings later when it's finally gotten rid of. Now, as you might imagine, the Valley of Ben Hinnom became sort of a notorious place. Imagine if you lived in a city, and outside of the city was a place where children were lit on fire until they were killed as a sacrifice to a foreign god. Imagine that. And now imagine how you might feel about that place. The Valley of Bin Hinnom became notorious if you ask a person, we mentioned earlier that when you ask a person to put something in their head, you say a word, something, a concept pops into their head. If you were to ask an ancient Hebrew person, hey, what do you think of when you think of the Valley of Ben Hinnom? Well, they would tell you a couple things. 
The first thing they would tell you is fire. Fire. The first thing they might mention would be the sacrifice of the children by fire, by Ahaz, and by Manasseh, and by the people they ruled over. The second thing they might think of with fire would be Josiah, because while the, Bible, while the, while the text doesn't exactly say it, it says it in elsewhere, that the way you get rid of an altar is you light it on fire. So we actually have two kinds of fire going on in the valley of Ben-Hinnom. You have the awful, terrible, heinous fire that killed children. And then you have Josiah coming along later and purging and cleansing the land with a fire of his own. No matter what you think of, though, when you hear the word Ben-Hinnom as an ancient Hebrew person, the first thing that pops in your head immediately is fire. Fire. It's where children are lit on fire. It's where Josiah wiped it out with fire. That's the place of fire. In time, though, a second thing would pop in your head, and that's punishment. You see, shortly after Josiah was done reigning, Josiah did the best that he could. Shortly after that happened, a nation and an empire called the Babylonians showed up. And the Babylonians came and they came a-conquering. And they came and they conquered the Israelite people. We read somewhat about this conquering in the book of Daniel. If you remember, Daniel's taken away by a Babylonian. He, he's taken to Babylon, and when they try to convert him, that's that whole background of that story. Is, you know, Daniel in the lion's den is all about you know, the Babylonian exile. Well, the Babylonians come along, and they conquer the people of Israel. They, absolute, they actually destroy the temple itself. They don't just close the temple like Ahaz did. They tear it to the ground, destroying the temple altogether. And the people of Israel had a simple question. Why would God allow this? Why, if God loves us, if we are God's chosen people, if we're God's special people, why, if we are the people that, that are following God and God is honoring us as we honor him, why would God allow the pagan, wicked, violent, bloodthirsty Babylonians to come and not only conquer us, not only murder us, not only steal our children and take them away, but also wipe out the temple so we can't worship him any longer? It's a good question. Why would God let that happen? And there was a prophet named Jeremiah who answered the question very specifically. And the answer to that question was the Valley of Ben-Hinnom. You see, there was a king who decided to use this valley as a place where they sacrificed children. There was a second king who decided to do nothing with those altars and just leave them alone. There was a third king who decided to use the Valley of Ben-Hinnom as a place to sacrifice children. For over a century, for over a hundred years, there was a place in Israel where children were murdered and sacrificed to a deity by lighting them on fire. This can't be overstated how horrible this was. And so Jeremiah tells the people that God wants you to know that if you're going to be the sort of people who are going to sacrifice your children to a false god, well, why would you take the moral high ground and expect God to protect you? You're asking Moloch to protect you. This is Moloch's protection. <laughs> it doesn't exist. If this is what you want, this is what God will give you. And so the Valley of Ben-Hinnom becomes this place that is notoriously associated not just with fire, but with punishment. So in time, the exile ends. We've all seen Poltergeist, right? Movie Poltergeist? We've all seen that? Okay. So, in the movie Poltergeist, you know how they build a house on a Native American burial ground? And you're watching this movie and you're screaming at the television, why would you build there? The Hebrew people, after the exile, agree with your screaming at the television. And so they looked at the Valley of Ben Hinnom and said, I don't want to live there. I don't want to live there. That's the reason God allowed the exile. That's, the, that, that's, that's where children were murdered by fire. I don't want to build a house there. I don't want to build a donut shop there. Uh, you know, I don't want to put my, 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 my mechanic. I don't want to put my, you know, my mechanic shop there. Like, let's just leave that be. And so they did. And in time, the valley became good for one thing and one thing only. 
a garbage dump. It's where the people dump their trash. And what do you do with your trash after you dump it? You light it on fire. So we have the fire now, the fire of the child sacrifice. You have the cleansing fire of Josiah getting rid of the altar, and you have the fire of the trash dump. So, question now is this. What does any of this have to do with hell? And the answer is pretty basic. When we read in our Bibles the word hell as spoken by Jesus, that's a terrible mistranslation. The word hell does not exist in any language at all during the time of Jesus. When Jesus spoke about hell, he used one of two words. Most of the time, we'll get to the second word here in a week or two, most of the time when he said the word hell, he said the word Gehenna, or at least that's what we read in our Bibles because our Bibles are written in Greek. Gehenna is a Greek translation for a Hebrew word called ben Hinnom. Here's what this means. In Mark chapter 9, put Mark chapter 9 back on the, on the screen. Here's what Mark chapter 9 should be saying. Here's what it actually says in the Greek. Jesus says to his disciples, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better to enter eternal life with only one hand than to go into the unquenchable fires of ben Hinnom with two hands. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter eternal life with only one foot to be thrown into ben Hinnom with two feet. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. It is better to enter the kingdom of God with only one eye than to have two eyes to be thrown into Ben Hinnom where the maggots never die and the fire never goes out. A little later, he's talking to the Pharisees. Put that back up there. Matthew chapter 23 says, What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of Ben Hinnom you yourselves are. You snakes, you sons of vipers, how will you escape the judgment of Ben Hinnom? I haven't a clue why we don't just translate it. We should. Other than it's a little confusing and we all know what hell is and none of us really know what Ben Hinnom is. But Jesus did not say hell. He said Gehenna, which is the Greek word for Ben Hinnom. The question still is yet to be answered. What did Jesus mean when he said Ben Hinnom? And the answer to that is a little complicated. You see, between the exile and the birth of Jesus, the people of Israel, as well as avoiding this valley, they started creating some doctrines around this valley. Okay? Now, one doctrine, very simply, was they said, okay, Ben Hinnom is shorthand for God's punishment because you have rejected him. But the punishment of Ben Hinnom, remember, was a specific thing. The Babylonians came along and conquered the people of Israel. So, for example, say when the Greeks come along, Alexander the Great, and come along, come along and conquer the people of Israel, or when the Romans come along and conquer the people of Israel, the ancient Jews would rightly call that Ben Hinnom. Rome shows up and, and unleashes Ben Hinnom on us. God's punishment by allowing us to be conquered. And you know what? It really does seem like Jesus could have been referring to that. To the Pharisees, for example, as he criticized them in Matthew chapter 23, if you keep reading to the end of Matthew chapter 23, he explicitly says one day the Romans are going to come very soon and they're going to destroy the temple. And that happened. About 40 years after Jesus died, the Romans come along and destroy the temple. Rightly, that could be called Ben Hinnom. On the other hand, the other, another group of Hebrews also kind of did what a lot of us do, and they used their imagination. And based on some other Bible verses, some other things, they came to the conclusion that Ben Hinnom was not just physical punishment, but that Ben Hinnom was spiritual punishment. Because again, physical punishment is sometimes for physical things, but spiritual punishment can come for spiritual things. And so they came up with this concept, this idea that Ben Hinnom didn't just refer to things that happened in this world or this life, but Ben Hinnom can refer to things in the next life. 
Now, interestingly enough, we talked last week about how the early church, they couldn't quite decide what hell really was. They couldn't decide, is this an eternal place of torture? Is it a place that's you know, temporary and then people get out? Is it a place where there's just destruction? They couldn't really decide exactly what that was, and so these different beliefs kind of popped up. Interestingly enough, that doesn't seem to be something the church came up with only. Because when the Jews came up with Ben Hinnom, for hundreds of years, they argued about what it was. Some of them said, well, Ben Hinnom is punishment that lasts forever. It's torture. Some of them said, well, Ben Hinnom is a place where people are destroyed. And some of them said, well, Ben Hinnom is a place where you go for a certain amount of time. God purges you of your sins, just like Josiah purged the land. And then you get out. (laughs) Hilariously, they couldn't figure it out either. You know what's interesting? Is when Jesus talked to his disciples, he sure doesn't sound like he's talking about uh, a physical punishment by a nation, does he? When he says, you'll be thrown into Ben Hinnom, sure seems like he is affirming this idea of some sort of punishment after death. Absolutely. It's like Jesus is either affirming or using or something. He's, he's allowing their understanding of things to impact the way he is teaching. Maybe he's just affirming that both of them are true. It's really, really hard to, put, to pin down exactly what Jesus meant. But what we know for sure is when Jesus said, you're going to go to Ben Hinnom, or you're, gonna, you're, a ch- you're a child of Ben Hinnom, he was talking specifically about this event or these series of events and God's response to a series of events that were associated with fire and punishment both in this life and in the life to come. That was their picture. A question, still unanswered. How in the world is this good news? The answer, I think, is pretty cool. You see, once we can place Ben Hinnom, or our translation of hell, once we can place it in a specific historical event that's written in the Bible, well, we can see God's response to a specific historical event written in the Bible. And here's what Jeremiah, the prophet, told the people God thought about Ben Hinnom. In Jeremiah chapter 7, God says, The people of Judah have sinned before my very eyes, said the Lord. They have set up their abominable idols right in the temple that bears my name, defiling it. They have built pagan shrines at Topheth, the garbage dump in the valley of Ben Hinnom. And there they burn their sons and daughters in the fire. I want us to hear this. God says, I have never commanded such a horrible deed. It never even crossed my mind to command such a thing. So beware. For the time is coming, says the Lord, when that garbage dump will no longer be called Topheth or the Valley of Ben Hinnom, but the Valley of Slaughter. Please hear me when I say this. Absolutely. A form of punishment is absolutely promised by God. It doesn't really answer exactly what it is. The valley of slaughter. God is saying there's going to be long-lasting ramifications for this. And so the Jews look and they say, okay, the valley of slaughter, that means when foreign nations come and conquer us, or that means when a wicked person dies and and is separate from God or is something with God. We can't really, we we argue about it, but it's something, some sort of post-death punishment. Okay, great. But the picture that pops in our heads when I say the word hell, if you are a normal person at all, It is people being lit on fire, right? Burning in hell. And yet, when God speaks to the people of Israel specifically about hell, quote unquote, or Ben Hinnom, which is where hell comes from, God says, that wasn't my idea. I never even thought that people That's not my idea. That's yours. Y'all are the ones who burn people. 
I don't do that. You do. That's why I'm punishing you, by the way. <laughs> that's, that, that's why I'm so angry. Y'all burned people. I, that wasn't something I do. That's something you did, and that's why I am so angry. And it makes sense why God would be angry. But I want you to hear this well. The predominant picture in our minds of hell cannot be true. Because God specifically separates himself from that picture of hell by saying, it never even crossed my mind to do that. Now look, hell is absolutely real. You betcha, what we call hell. We should probably just call it ben Hinnom is what we should call it. That's what Jesus called it. Absolutely real. Absolutely. God promises this will be known as the valley of slaughter. There's punishment coming for this. God was so upset with his people for doing this. There is punishment coming. Absolutely. And Jesus affirms that punishment. But also... God tells us, it's not what I want. It's not what I made. It's not who I am. It's the opposite of me. And the picture that's in your head is the exact opposite of what it ought to be. Because I'm not the one who burns people. Y'all are. This morning, we're in our second week of our series called Fear, Brimstone, and the Love of God. And for this month, I want to challenge us to look at the, the doctrines of hell a little bit different, not by avoiding them. So often we in the church avoid hell, but instead by looking at them square in the face and saying, okay, what does Jesus actually teach about hell and where did he get it from? And when we do that, we find beautiful news. You see, fear and love are opposites. And so often when we consider hell, we are stricken by fear because it's a terrifying thing. And yet as Christians, we're not supposed to be stricken by fear because John told us in his letter to the church that fear and love are opposites, that love casts out fear like Jesus casts out demons. And this morning, we learn a lesson that can help us move away from fear and toward the love of God away from where God does not want us to be and towards where God does. Our second lesson from fear and brimstone and the love of God is this. Whatever hell is, it was not God's idea or will for anyone. Hell is against all that God's love stands for. Let me say that again. Understanding that hell is Ben Hinnom. Whatever Ben Hinnom is, it was not God's idea or will for anyone. Ben Hinnom is against all that God's love stands for. Usually at this point in the sermon, I talk about other stuff, but I gotta be honest, this is incredibly important. Next week, we'll answer a question because the next question should be, okay, well, but what doesn't, well it's not what God wants, and if it's what is against God, and yet you're telling me that God does it. Last week, we said God has control over hell, God has power in hell, and yet this week you're telling me God doesn't want it. The natural question is, well, then why is God doing something he doesn't want? Next week, we'll answer exactly that. But we need to pause for a second. And before we move on to the next question, just sit with this fact that this isn't what God wants. This isn't something God created. This isn't something that God invented. This is us. This is people. This is a wicked king saying, I want to sacrifice children. This is his grandson saying, yeah, it's a good idea. Let's do it because his father didn't get rid of the altar. This is God saying, you want to be my people, but you also want to worship Moloch. You want to do the worst things any human king can do, and yet you want to call yourselves my people. If you want Moloch's protection, here it is. And God allowing Babylon to conquer them. This is them then saying, well, if that's what that is in the valley of slaughter is not just a, an earthly thing. It must be an after death thing. And Jesus affirming that in one way or another by telling his disciples, if something causes you to sin, get rid of it. And yet none of those things are an accurate reflection of the loving nature of God. This is not what God wanted. This is not what God planned. And God doesn't want hell anyone. 
God is love. And out of his love, God wants all of us to have life eternal. So when the musicians come forward, they're going to sing a song. We offer this invitation each and every week. It's a chance to take God up on his offer of life eternal. The Bible teaches that when we understand who Jesus is, that we're to repent and be baptized. Repent is us turning our backs on who we used to be. Being baptized is a, is a physically symbolic act of that spiritual reality. We go down in some water. It's like our old selves being put to death. We get out of the water. It's our new selves being born again. The Bible promises that when we do that, our sins are washed away. We're made brand new, brand clean. The Holy Spirit within us, forgiveness of sins, and we are his. If you've never made that decision, we got a nice warm baptistry. All sorts of people can do it. Let's talk. If you're an immersed believer in Christ, looking for a perfect church home, this place is not it. We do serve a perfect God. We want to connect. We want to call. We want to cultivate. We want to meet new people. We want to share the gospel. We want to grow up while we do it. And more than anything else, we want to be moving away from fear and towards the love of God. Because love casts out fear as we stand and as we sing.